as you guys know, I love it when I have a studio in guest. And today I couldn't be more excited to have in my studio today as my guest, Rance Howard. Um, so welcome to the Home Movie Legacy Project. Well, thank you, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Well, I'm happy to have you. And, you know, it's kind of interesting how it came about because your son Clint was in here a few weeks ago getting some home movies transferred. Yeah. And after I had the pleasure of meeting him, I said, you know, I'd love to have you come on the show. And we had such a great interview. We just started talking and we thought, wow, it would be so awesome to have the patriarch of the Howard family here on the Home Movie Legacy Project with us. Well, hey, that's a big kick. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> So, Rance, you have been an actor for over 60 years. That's right. It's yes. amazing. Well, uh, it is. You know, when you, uh, you, you, you are on the uh, 86th rung uh, of the time ladder and you look down, uh, <laughs> you say, well, yeah, is, I've been, uh, been around for a while. You've been around and you have such a legacy of amazing work and just... Um, you know, just somebody whose work I've always admired. So, you know, I want to know a little bit about your early background. Are you originally from Oklahoma? Uh, yes, I am. Yes, I, I was born in Oklahoma, uh, out in, in the country, uh, a place called uh, K County. Not born in town, born at home, uh -huh. K County, Oklahoma. And uh, my parents were uh, stock farmers. They right. raised a lot of cattle and hogs and farmed and uh, horses. Uh, my mother, uh, she was sort of angling for me to be a cowboy. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad, uh, he was uh, raising me to be a plowboy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a little conflict there. <laughs> so how is it that you ended up deciding to go into acting? You really want to know. I do. Okay. Absolutely. All right. All right. This is, <laughs> now, this is the actual, this is the, the facts. Uh, I was going to a little one-room country school. Uh, it was called Little Beaver. And every uh, holiday season, every Christmas season, they did uh, a Christmas program. And, of course, uh, everyone in that school district and in surrounding school districts were invited. And uh, th this, was really, uh, this was really out in the hinterlands. So... Uh, they didn't have a lot of choices of entertainment. They had radio, uh, but it was like six or seven miles to the nearest movie. And uh, so, okay, so entertainment was a, was a privilege and a premium uh, for, for people in that area. And so the, the, the school, they liked to put on this Christmas program. Everybody would come. It was a one-room country school. And they always, they packed them in. I'm, I'm telling you, the audience was packed in, like, pardon the cliche, uh, sardines. <laughs> and, and people were even standing out looking in the windows to see and hear. So uh, the, the, the teacher, uh, one day, uh, probably in November, uh, said to me, she didn't ask me, she said to me, we're doing a, a one-act comedy play and uh, you're going to be in it. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, uh, uh, it's called The Hired Man. You're going to play The Hired Man. And uh, uh, here's the manuscript for it. And you should learn these lines. And we will rehearse it. And now, there were four people in the play. There was myself, the guy who was the farmer, who was my boss, his wife, uh, and his niece, who figured prominently in the cast. Uh, the, the idea was that she was from the big city and was maybe having some problems in the big city. So she was being sent out to be with uh, her uncle, the farmer, and her aunt, uh, the farmer's wife. And uh, so the farmer was training me, training me, tempy, temp, uh, <laughs> preparing me. Mm -hmm preparing me to uh, go down to the railway station and meet his niece, impress her, and bring her home, and continue to impress her out here on the farm. So uh, uh, the, the, the crux of the play was uh, that the, the farmer 
giving me instructions. And I was, uh, you're too young to know what uh, a Toby was, a Toby show. Toby shows, they, they traveled in tents, okay. and uh, Tobys wore uh, baggy pants with uh, stripes or checks or something, and uh, they, were, they were funny characters. And they had, usually wore fright wigs where the hair stood up on end, and, uh, and like... Uh, a typical Toby humor okay. was uh, a guy comes running in and says, oh, 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 I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. <laughs> and, and, and the other guy says, well, what's wrong? He says, oh, I, 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 I just swallowed an egg. <laughs> the guy says, well, uh, how can I help? He says, well, 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 what should I do? What should I do? Because if I run, I'll break it. And if I sit, I'll hatch it. That's Toby humor. And so th this... This whole play was a little like that. Okay, okay. But uh, anyway, I, uh, I, I learned this. I had seen these kind of shows when I was a kid. I mean, a tent show would come to town, and sometimes my mom and dad would take me to see the tent show. And sometimes they called them medicine shows, where they, they sold medicine. Uh, that was their big... Uh, income medicine but okay but now I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm I learn these these lines and the time finally comes to do the and, and at, at, at these Christmas programs uh, they have uh, st certain kids who speak pieces they were called uh, re recite poems uh, sing uh, Christmas hymns Christmas carols uh, and so that was, and it was, you know, probably about, uh, probably about an hour, hour and a half program. And <clears throat> I, uh, and, and, and we rehearsed in the school. We didn't have a stage. It's, it, we rehearsed on it, just a level floor. And uh, we, what we did to create the stage, we pushed the teacher's desk out of the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, for a curtain, they had a wire attached from one wall to the other with a bed sheet on it. Mm -hmm. And then they had one of the school kids would pull, you know, one of them would pull one side of the curtain, the other pull the other side of the curtain. And so that's it's kind of the, uh, the, the setup. And I'm in the seventh grade, seventh grade. And uh, so, okay, the, it came time for our show to start, our play. And uh, they opened the curtain, and I walked out and said my first line, and the audience laughed. And I said another line, and then they laughed again. Now, there is a, a thing that sometimes happens to actors. It happens to me probably more than other people, but it happened to me that night. Uh, and the thing that happens is you suddenly transform mm -hmm. from being yourself to being the character you're playing. And now, Rhonda, I got to tell you, that is a powerful thing when that happens to you. That is what that is. You know, that's orgasmic. That is fantastic. Well, that happened to me that night. And and I suddenly became this guy, this character. And I could do no wrong. I, my, all the lines I said got extra big laughs. Uh, I walked around on stage, and I, I didn't change the staging very much, a little bit. But uh, everything, and, and the audience every once in a while would burst into applause. And uh, it was just, it, it just went just swimmingly. Well, uh, Finally, the, 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 the play ended and we got tremendous applause, big laughs, big boffo laughs. And uh, after, after, the, after the program was over, I had farmers, people that I barely knew coming up and patting me on the head or slapping me on the back and saying, you're a mighty fine chore boy. <laughs> well... I, I had never had such 
attention uh -huh. and such adulation in my life. That was just wow. And, and, and so, okay, the, finally the program was over and uh, everyone went home. And I thought about this the next two or three days and sort of tried to, in my own uh, inept way, try to analyze what had happened and, 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 and kind of tried to relive it and decided that's what I want to be. I want to be an actor. I want to feel that again. I want to have that, that experience because that just, that buoys you up. I mean, that really elevates you. And uh, so, okay, uh, f so how do you become an actor right, right. when you're a kid out in Oklahoma? Right. Well, I, I, I went to, uh, uh, went to, eventually got into high school and took speech class, did all of the little skits and programs that they'd let me do in high school. And, uh, and it was, and I was, it was great. I was doing all these little plays and sketches, and it was fun. And, and I, I knew now that's what I was going to be. I was going to be an actor. And uh, so as graduation started to roll around, and I'm now about 17 years old, uh, I started telling all my friends what I was going to do when I graduated. I, was, I had a, see, I, I was, I, I, that was a, a really a working farm. Uh, some people might call it a ranch, but I had several horses. I had one particularly good uh, Arabian spotted mare that uh, uh, I call Lucky. And she was a really, really good, good horse. And uh, I said, I'm going to ride my horse out to Hollywood, California, and show all those people what a real cowboy looks like <laughs> and when he rides. Because I, you know, I looked at Roy Rogers and Gene Autry and Tex Ritter and a few of those people, and, and they were okay, but they weren't really cowboys. They weren't really good riders, you know? They didn't become part of the horse. They were just kind of, you know, flapping along. And, and I knew that, I, I felt sure, that if in Hollywood they saw me riding a horse, riding Lucky, uh, they would hire me to be one of those movie star cowboys. And I was telling everybody that's what I was going to do, go ride my horse to Hollywood, it's going to become a, a movie star. And so one day the principal called me in and said, uh, what's this I hear about you, uh, you know, wanting to go to Hollywood on your horse? And I said, yes, sir. And I told him the whole idea. And he said, well, you know, that isn't a bad idea. He said, you know what you should do? He said, before you go to Hollywood, he said, you ought to go down to the University of Oklahoma. They have a drama school. Take some drama classes. Learn something about acting. And then when you ride into Hollywood, You've got some background. You have something, you know, to, to a foundation. And that sounded made good sense. And so I went home to tell my folks that I thought uh, I needed to go to the University of Oklahoma. Well, I, my dad was planning for me to go to college anyway, but he was going to send me to Oklahoma A&M. That was Agriculture and Mechanical oh, School. Okay. <laughs> and, and also he thought I'd make one heck of a veterinarian. Right, right. Uh, but uh, Mama kind of took my side, and she thought that uh, if I wanted to go down to the University of Oklahoma and study acting and get into show business, I ought to be allowed to do that. So, okay, when school started, I went down to the University of Oklahoma and was able to enroll in the drama school and, and started learning something about plays. I learned about Broadway. I learned about plays that ran for two or three years on Broadway in New York and that the audiences came and they applauded and they laughed and we did plays there at college and uh, that really, uh, that, that began to, to turn me around from being a, a, a movie star cowboy to maybe being a Broadway actor and I, I, I learned about uh, uh, the Barrymores and uh, well, you know, all those great stage actors. And uh, so I, I really started preparing myself for a stage career. And after about five semesters, 
uh, I, I was I was talking with one of the professors, and and it, it began to really dawn on me that here at the drama school they weren't really preparing us to go out and become actors. They wanted us to be teachers. They wanted us to be oh. professors, uh, so, so some kind of educational executives or something. And because because the, the whole idea of being a professional actor was so, uh, it, was, it was a cutthroat business. Oh, sure. It was heartbreaking. And they didn't want to send their students out to have their hearts broken right, and their throats right. cut. And so uh, I, I decided, well, if I can't be an actor, then I've got to change, you know, chart a different course for my life. So uh, I, I went to New York City to see if I thought it was prof- possible to become a professional actor. And I went to New York City and I was lost for the first two or three weeks. I, I got a job just to sustain myself uh, as a doorman at the Roxy Theater. Roxy Theater was sort of a copy of uh, what is now Radio City Music Hall. Uh, Roxy Theater sort of copied it. It was a, it was a big, fine movie palace, and they uh, uh, had a stage show uh, with uh, big prominent entertainers, and then they would run a first-class movie. And uh, so it, 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 it became uh, my, my, my job uh, to uh, like stand out on the curb or in the archway of the theater and uh, say, you are going in now for a stage and screen performance. There is still time to see Richard Hames and Buster Keaton. You are going in now for a stage and screen performance. And then also, I, I, sometimes I'd stand in the theater and, and say, uh, the best remaining seats are on the mezzanine floor. Kindly use the grand stairway to your left, please. Uh, and, uh, and, and I felt pretty good because I was using what I had learned at the University of Oklahoma. <laughs> you were saying it with enthusiasm and conviction. Yes, yes. And uh, so anyway, I, I also started... I, I learned about making rounds to look for jobs, and I was making rounds, uh, and uh, uh, I, I had read about in one of the uh, one of the trade papers called uh, Showbiz uh, about a company that was going to send out a children's theater tour, and so I went up and auditioned there, and I I did a scene from Of Mice and Men, and. It was. It went very well. I, I almost had that. I almost got that orgasmic feeling again. And do you know, at that audition, there was this beautiful, red-headed girl that I had dated in college, and she was there auditioning. And so I I, I met her and chatted with her for a little while, and went home and after two or three days now the place I was staying we I didn't have a telephone there was a phone in the hall someone called and uh, left a message for me I wasn't there of course uh, and the message was to call such and such a number at such and such a time and I did and it was the the director of the children's theater company and he said yes we would like to use you in our tour and would you come down and meet with the producer? Well, I did. I went down and I met with the producer, and uh, I, I got the part. They were going to let me play uh, the Huntsman, Bombardo the Huntsman, in uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And uh, then they were going to let me play a comedy character called Sir Pantywaist uh, in Cinderella. And then also, uh, I was going to have to be assistant stage manager. And uh, yes, I did have a driver's license, okay. and I, I was going to drive the prop truck. So for all of that, uh, I would get fifty-five dollars a week. Wow! <laughs> yes, well, that's what I said. Wow! And of course, back then they hadn't heard of per diem yet. Yeah. So we we paid for our breakfast and our lunch and our dinner, 
and our hotel room, you could get at, they had a hotel chain called the Milner chain, where you could get a pretty decent room for sometimes two fifty, mm-hmm. sometimes a dollar seventy five. Wow. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, so okay, I was, uh, and and oh, incidentally, that beautiful redhead girl, she also got a part. She was playing Cinderella, and and she was playing a ladies in waiting or a lady and something like that in Snow White. And she was also understudying Snow White. And so it was great. And her name was Jean. Jean Frances Spiegel. And she was a terrific actress. She was a knockout. She had been, I don't know, she had studied at the Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City and, and had ended up down at the University of Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma because uh, she had been, uh, she hit by, hit by a truck. And really? was, yeah, and was badly... Uh, injured, oh, yeah. and and so uh, she had been sent back to Oklahoma with her parents to recuperate, and uh, she got recuperated well well enough that she wanted to come back to uh, the academy, uh, but her parents said, "Well, why don't you go back to University of Oklahoma, and uh, uh, you know heal up a little more, and and then you can go back to New York." Well, okay, she did, and that's where she met me. Uh, she might have been better uh, <laughs> going back to New York. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, um, on, on this tour, uh, we she and I started dating. And after, uh, oh, I don't know, not too long a time, uh, we were having so much fun. And, and life was, I can't tell you how great life was. There, there we were on tour, a, a tour that was originated in New York City, mm-hmm. and we were out playing all over the United States, traveling in a, bru- in a bus and a prop truck, prop truck, and life couldn't have been better. That was so fantastic. Well, uh, after after a while, I proposed to her. And, and we decided, yes, we would get married. And uh, we told the company manager, and the company manager, of course, tried to talk us out of it immediately. And she finally took Jean aside and said, do you have to get married? <laughs> and, and, and Jean said, no, 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 nothing like that. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, we, we decided. Now, the problem was with getting married when you're on tour, is there usually is like a three-day waiting period to get married. And uh, we, were only, we were playing one-night stands, and we were in no town, never in a town for three days. Yeah. Uh, so you couldn't, like, get a marriage license in a particular town and wait the three days in order for it to become... That's right. That was our dilemma. Okay. Well, uh, uh, we, were, we were in some restaurant uh, over in uh, Ohio, and we were talking about our problem. And the waiter happened to overhear us, and he said, uh, listen, he says, if you go across over into Kentucky, he said, you can get married there in one day. Well, it just so happened our tour was headed for Kentucky. And so uh, the, the, the town that we were coming to next to play our show was Winchester, Winchester, Kentucky. And so Jean and I decided, uh, incidentally, she had, she had started riding in the prop truck to keep me company. <laughs> and that was nice. Uh, so we, we pulled into Winchester, Kentucky and got the, our scenery up and did everything like, like that and our prop truck unloaded. And then Gene and I went off to uh, buy our rings and get our blood tests and get our marriage license. And oh yes, we had to find a minister. Uh, we, we found a minister who was willing to come down after the show meet us in the lobby of the Brown Proctor Hotel and marry us. Great story. And, uh, okay, so we did our show. Show went great. We went back to, and we packed up the show so we could leave the next day. Uh, went back uh, to the hotel. There was the minister. And uh, the, the uh, company manager had remained, had kind of arranged a sort of wedding party for us. And, uh, had bought uh, 
three bakery cakes and pile them up on top of one another and and that was our wedding cake and uh, there there had been a funeral in town that day so there weren't any flowers we didn't have any flowers but uh, we had a we, we had a kind of a wonderful ceremony the uh, the, the seven dwarves, uh, they, they did a little number uh, to uh, the tune of uh, Here Come the Brides. And uh, the minister succeeded in marrying us. And uh, our, our company manager, uh, our, actually our company director, who was actually the manager, really. And uh, he, 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 he was, had been sort of a comedian. And, and he... he he, he talked for about oh, 10 minutes. Very funny guy. And uh, anyway, uh, that that it was it was a wonderful wedding ceremony, and it was it was all over. And uh, we went back to uh, our hotel, and that was our wedding night in our hotel. Next day, we packed up and we were on the road. That's awesome. Well, we're going to take a little commercial break here. And don't go away. You're listening to the Home Movie Legacy Project. When we come back, we'll continue our interview with the amazing Rance Howard. Raising the consciousness as to why home movies are so important. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vigent. And we'll be back with more right after these on Rockstar Worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for you to create indestructible wealth. Get ready for wealth with Paul Mata and create indestructible wealth. Learn how to make, sustain, and protect your wealth in any economy. Listen live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern and on demand 24-7 right here on Rockstar Worldwide. Paul Mata is the creator of the system for creating indestructible wealth. Paul will share easy tips and strategies on how you can grow all of your assets so you can live an abundant and prosperous life. Each high-energy show will feature interviews with experts who will help you on your path to creating indestructible wealth. For more on Paul, the show, and his Create Indestructible Wealth boot camps, check out Create Indestructible Wealth with Paul Mata or go to createindestructiblewealth.com. Learn how to make, sustain, and protect your wealth in any economy so you can live an abundant and prosperous life with a passion to serve others. Are you excited about getting your home movies and photos organized, but don't know where to start? Well, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers, www.appo.org, can help. The photo organizers are made up of a community of people. They're organizers, photographers, graphic designers, storytellers, historians, people just like you who love photos, home movies, and most importantly, the stories they tell. Through training, education, networking, and collaboration, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers strives to advance this new and growing profession of photo life management. Our hundreds of trained personal photo organizers specialize in helping you rescue your irreplaceable photos and home movies and organize them in ways that make it simple to share your memories, lives, and traditions. Our goal is to help you make those distant memories tangible so you can cherish the life that you share with others. If you need help, look for a personal photo organizer near you by going to appo.org. We are excited and ready to help. Welcome back to the Home Movie Legacy Project, showcasing compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories. Rhonda is all about preserving our visual heritage for generations to come before it's too late. So let's get back to the show. It's the Home Movie Legacy Project on Rockstar Worldwide. And here again is your host, Rhonda Vigent. Welcome back to the show. We're interviewing Rance Howard today. He's been an actor for over 60 years. And uh, if you missed the first segment, we were talking about his early beginnings, how he got into acting. And uh, it's just an amazing story, Rand. So I read that you were in um, Mr. Roberts with Henry Fonda. Oh, yes, I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after uh, my uh, uh, children's theater experience, uh, I, Gene and I went back to New York, and I made rounds. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, 
heard about uh, a casting of uh, a road company of Mr. Roberts. I, I went down to, to uh, well, first of all, uh, the, the guy, there was a guy who was an agent and he was also working as a casting director for Mr. Roberts. He's, uh, I, uh, I went up to his office and uh, his name was, his last name was Morris. And I said, well, Mr. Morris, uh, I heard that you're casting Mr. Roberts. He said, oh yes, I am. And, and he was, now, now Morris, Mr. Morris was a little light in the loafers. Uh, <laughs> and he was a, a kind of a nervous little guy. And he said, uh, well, you wouldn't be right for this show because he says, these are men uh, on this show, they're out in the South Pacific on a uh, cargo ship and they're muscular and they're suntanned and uh, they're, you know, they're, they're bulky and, uh, but muscular and, uh, and, and athletes. And I suddenly, I ripped off my jacket, I ripped off my shirt and flexed my muscles. <laughs> and I said, I fought in college. And he said, and he reached over and he felt my bicep. And he said, oh my. <laughs> so, so he, he arranged for an audition. Uh -huh. And uh, I, was, I was supposed to uh, go down to uh, the Alvin Theater. That's where Mr. Roberts had been playing mm -hmm. and was still playing and, uh, and, and audition. And I, uh, for, I think somebody named Billy Hammerstein uh, who was uh, sort of an assistant to Josh Logan, who was a director. And I went down and uh, they gave me a script. And uh, I, I don't know, uh, if, Ron, if you ever had that experience or not, but the, uh, the, the, the stage is lit by a light bulb just hanging down on a wire. And uh, it's, you know, it's if we're rehearsing on or auditioning on the, uh, what was the deck of the AK-01, which was the ship in Mr. Roberts. Uh, and uh, they had given me a script to read and, and uh, a scene that we wanted to read, and I read that. And uh, okay, they, they, they sent a lot of us home. They had some of us to wait, and they, uh, I waited, and uh, they said, well, okay, come back tomorrow and uh, work on the scene, come back tomorrow. I worked on the scene, came back. Now, I, you would think that that would have winnowed out of a few people, but there were more on the callback than there was on the first you know, wow. call. Well, anyway, I, I auditioned again, and uh, I was called back again, and, now, and I heard that this time, Josh Logan was going to be there. And so, okay, I came back, and uh, I auditioned for Josh Logan. And, uh, okay, uh, it, it was looking really good. I, I, I didn't get I didn't get dismissed. Well, uh, finally, uh, it was another night, and we're there uh, auditioning, and uh, Josh Logan is is uh, you know people are being cast in different roles and everything. Josh Logan is now walking around in the orchestra pit, kind of stroking his chin, and 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 looking up, you know. And, and suddenly he looked up at me and pointed right at me and he said, Lindstrom! Well, Lindstrom was a character in the play and that's just what Josh Logan had decided to cast me as Lindstrom. Okay, so now I'm, I'm gonna play Lindstrom and uh, uh, we go into rehearsal and rehearsal goes great. We go up and, and our, we open in Boston, Boston, Massachusetts. I think you've heard of Boston. My hometown. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we went out on tour. It was a great experience. We were now traveling first class by train. We had our own car. Uh, and uh, it was just, it was fantastic. I could take Jean along with me on the train if she wanted to come. And uh, it, it was, uh, to the icing on the cake was one day, one night, we were playing Pittsburgh. Henry Fonda came backstage after the show. And we all gathered around there and everybody said, you all know Henry Fonda, of course we all did. And uh, he said, boys, you've got a good show here. He said, how would you like to come out to Hollywood with me? Well, we all thought that was a great idea. So uh, it was decided that 
I mean, the show was going to play Los Angeles. Uh, and the, uh, the idea was that John Forsyth, who was playing Mr. Roberts in our company, was going to trade places with Henry Fonda. Henry Fonda was going to take the road company out to Los Angeles. John Forsyth was going back to Broadway where Mr. Roberts was still running. Well, that was just super. And it was, I can't tell you how great it was working with Henry Fonda. The man, he was, he was such a gentleman. And uh, he, he became, he and I actually became friends. He liked to do little improvisational scenes. He, he, he loved to do improvisational arguments. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, uh, like in, 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 in a barber shop, uh, he would come up and start arguing with me. He says, well, he says, he says, your haircut may look better, but my barber's faster. And I'd argue with him, no, it wasn't. You know? And uh, we, we, we did that. He loved to do that. Uh, one day, uh, he and I were uh, uh, trying to check into a hotel and uh, we got in an argument and his wife, Suzanne, Susan, Susan, yeah, Susan Hammerstein was his wife. And she came up behind him and we were arguing and she says, Henry, what's wrong? What's the matter? <laughs> he turned around, looked at her. He looked back at me and he looked back at her. He says, she doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually your family did make it out to Burbank, right? You had your children here in, in uh, on the West Coast? No, oh, no. no, not exactly. Uh, our son, Ron, was born while I was in the United States Air Force. Oh, I see. And uh, he was born uh, in my wife's hometown, Duncan, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was his birthplace. Uh, after about six weeks, uh, Gene brought him back and joined me at Chinoot Air Force Base in Illinois. To, for, I was working in, the, in special services doing plays, running the service club, put, doing entertainment, variety shows. I, I directed over 40 plays while wow. I, was, I, was in, I was in the Air Force three years, 11 months, 11 days. Uh, but uh, to get back, you, you want to move ahead. Uh, my son, Clint, whom you know very well, I think, uh, he was born in Burbank. Oh, okay. Uh, over here at St. Joseph's Hospital. Oh, all right. Yeah, uh, he, was, he was born here. And uh, both, 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 both boys were uh, uh, educated here. They went to grammar school, high school. And uh, Ron went to USC for a while. Clint went to Pepperdine for a while. And uh, yeah. And so we're, we've, we've lived in Burbank for, oh, I, must be nearly 50 years. Well, everybody knows that you're pretty much considered a Hollywood family because your kids got into show business so young, and you even played with them on a few shows. Um, how did that all come to be, that you actually got your boys into the business? With Ron, it was almost an accident. I was making rounds uh, in New York and uh, walked into a casting director's office that was just jam-packed with boys, I'd say about between six and 10 years old. And uh, uh, the, 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 the casting director said, I'm mean, not the casting director, the casting director's assistant said, uh, Mr. Wilkinson is really busy seeing all these boys today. Uh, he, he couldn't possibly work you in. I said, well, that's okay. Uh, I'll, I'll come back another time. I said, could I leave him a note? And she said, sure. So I said, dear Mr. Wilkinson, drop by to see you. Notice you're very busy. I'll drop in another time. Signed it, Rance Howard. And then below that, just tongue in cheek, just said, P.S. I have a son who's a very fine actor. Well, an actor's always trying to do something, trying to look for a, 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 a crack in the wall, some way to get through. And Ron uh, had, I had done Mr. Roberts and Summer Stock, 
Ron had watched the show being rehearsed and being performed, and I had discovered that he had learned most of Ensign Pulver's lines. In Mr. Roberts, Pulver and Roberts uh, are, are uh, roommates on the ship. And uh, so I found out that and Ron could do the scene. And so we started using that team just, just to, to entertain people. And uh, so uh, the next day I got a call saying, uh, well, bring your son up. I'd like to meet him. And I brought Ron up and he was three years old at that time. And uh, Mr. Wilkinson looked at him and said, well, he's a cute kid, but what can he do? I said, watch this. And we did this scene from Mr. Roberts. And Mr. Wilkinson just about fell out of his chair. He said, that is just, that is wonderful. Do you think he could learn anything else? I said, I believe he could. And he gave me a little two-page scene. And he said, well, take this home and work with him. Come back tomorrow and, and we'll see. And so I did. I took, and, and Ron learned those lines so fast. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I'd say, okay, you're playing this, this little boy on a bus and there's a man in the back seat who seems to be sick and you come up and talk to him. And uh, this is what you say, and this is what he says, and this is what you say. And Ron learned that in about 20 minutes. We went back and did the scene for Mr. Wilkinson, and Mr. Wilkinson again was astonished. And he said, he said, this boy is amazing. Uh, he said, I, I want the director to meet him. I'm sure he'll want to be screen tested. So, uh, okay, uh, we went back and met uh, the director and uh, Mr. Litvak, Anatole Litvak. Uh, and uh, at, at any rate, he, yes, he did the scene for Mr. Litvak. He ended up being screen tested. He ended up getting a, a, a part of a little boy, the, the son of uh, E.G. Marshall and Ann Jackson, mm. and uh, who were in Europe, and he was an engineer, and they were traveling on a bus trying to get out of Hungary. Uh, it, was, it was based, the, the whole story was based on uh, the Hungarian revolt, where the Hungarians revolted against the Iron Curtain. And Yul Brynner was going to star in it, and uh, other, like E.G. Marshall, uh, Robert Morley, had a w wonderful cast, and uh, they, they, so they, they were making a, 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 an offer to Ron, to Ronnie, we claimed Ronnie at that time. And uh, Gene and I talked about it. We weren't sure we wanted a kid in show business right. because we'd heard all those horror stories about, uh, uh, you know, kids that uh, had, had been in, in thing, terrible things that had happened to them. And then we decided, well, all right, let's do it. Uh, we, we'll do it. It was being filmed for about three or four months in Vienna, Austria. And it sounded really t too good to just sneeze at. And uh, besides, Mr. Litvak was offering me a small role in the movie. And so, okay, on Ron, uh, just like when Ron was just two or three days after his fourth birthday, we were on a plane headed for Vienna, Austria. Wow, that's pretty cool. That's pretty really cool, cool. Yeah. really. Cool. I mean, just, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, it's, it's, you know, but anyway, we did, we went over and uh, Ron had a wonderful time working on this movie. Uh, he loved the, 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 the people, everything went great. And uh, by that time we had decided, yeah, maybe this would be a good thing to have, maybe, maybe it's a good thing. So uh, we uh, ended up cashing in our uh, plane tickets, exchanging them for uh, ship tickets, and we sailed out of Southampton Harbor in England uh, on the night of July the 4th, 19, what, 50? I don't know. 56, 57, something like that. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so I got to tell you something. Coming, we'd been away for f four or five months. 
where you didn't hear, you didn't hear English spoken very much, a lot of foreign language, a lot of things you didn't understand. Coming into the harbor and sailing past the Statue of Liberty was one of the greatest things that I've ever experienced. I stood on the bow of the ship and there was the Statue of Liberty and we sailed past it. And I got to tell you, I got a lump in my throat, tears in my eyes. I was so glad to see that lady. We sailed past her. Great story. Came on home, came on back to New York, went to my agent's office and he said, Rance, a strange thing has happened. He said, there's no work here in New York anymore for television actors. They have, everything has, they've, they've stopped doing live television. Everything has switched to film. And since they have so many film studios in Hollywood, the industry has moved to the West Coast. He said, you ought to be going, you said, you ought to go out there to Hollywood. And uh, he says, they're be going, going to be doing a hundred Westerns. He said, you'll work all the time. So I went home and told Gene, we ought to pack and go to Hollywood. So we did. We packed up our old 52 Plymouth and headed for Hollywood. In the summertime, it was in in late in July. It was really hot. Uh, We decided to, Stop driving in the daytime, sleep in a nice air conditioned mo- air conditioned motel uh, at, uh, in the daytime and try drive at night, and so we did that, and uh, we stopped we, we we stopped in Las Vegas and decided we'd try our luck. We might get lucky in Las Vegas, and uh, I went in and uh, played shot craps for, I, I, I don't know, about an hour. And I'd been, uh, been up and I'd been down. I'd been up and been down. Well, when I was even, I decided I'd quit. Mm-hmm. And I walked out, went out to the car where Gene was sitting in the car with Ronnie. and said, honey, uh, I broke even. She said, well, let me go in and try my luck on the slot machines. I said, okay. So she went in and came out after a while. She had a bucket full of quarters. She had won. She had been she had hit some kind of a jackpot. Well, that was great. And we had hit the jackpot. And we found out a little while later we had hit the jackpot in another way because Jean was pregnant with Clint. That's awesome. It happened in Las Vegas. Yes, that's great. <laughs> well, we got out to Hollywood and got it, but we ended up getting an apartment in Burbank. Uh-huh. And uh, Clint was born there. And Ron eventually started working as a child actor. And I was, uh, I was able to ply my, my trade as being able to ride a horse pretty well and get some television work and things were going pretty well. Ron Clint was born and uh, two like a uh, couple of years later after he, one day when Ron was doing the Andy Griffith show, Gene brought Clint over to visit on the set and he came over wearing his cowboy hat, his little leather fringe jacket and his cowboy boots with a pistol strapped to his hip. And the director, a wonderful Irishman named Bob Sweeney, took one look at Clint and looked up at Sheldon Leonard, the producer, and he said, we ought to put this boy in an episode. And about a week later, a script came out with a character named Leon who didn't say a word, but he went around eating a peanut butter sandwich and offering it to everyone. Well, uh, that, that's and okay. And so that Clint started out, uh, Ron's agent picked up Clint and was, was agenting for him. And in no time at all, this boy was working all the time. 
And that was how Clinton got started. And Ron continued in the Andy Griffith Show. And, uh, and, and so anyway, that, that's how the boys got started in acting. It's neat. It's an amazing story. So you've been an actor for 60 years. What would you say what your favorite role has been? That is such a difficult question because almost every role I do is my favorite role. Maybe, maybe my favorite role was, there was a movie called Far and Away mm -hmm. that was taken from, partly from my family history. When Ron was about five or six years old, I took him to visit my grandmother, who was his great-grandmother, and she told him all about his great-grandfather who had ridden in the Cherokee Strip land race and told him all about that, uh, that the, the land race where people ran to try to stake claims in this uh, land that had belonged to the American Indians, the Native Americans, but had they had been moved onto reservations and their land was open for settlement. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, my grandfather, both of my grandfathers, both of my grandfathers ran in that race. And uh, Ron, Ron, and she even took out a newspaper that had a picture of the beginning of the race. And she looked at a rider on a horse and she said, that was your great grandfather. Ron remembered all that. And so somewhere down the line in his career, when he was uh, working with his partner, Brian Grazer, he started talking about this land race and they decided they'd put together a script. They put together a story about the land race and people coming to America. And uh, uh, so they, 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 how I got involved in it, uh, Ron had the writer call me up and ask me some horse, some horse questions about how long it would take to break a horse and how long could a horse run and things like that. And uh, I answered the questions and uh, they, they developed, they decided, they developed the guy that would be selling horses and they decided to make me that character. And, and his, they decided to call him my grandfather's name, which was Ralph Tomlin. So I was playing my grandfather, Ralph Tomlin, and there was a, a, a great moment when we were getting ready to reenact the land race. And, and, and I was sitting on my horse. Well, I actually, there's a little thing that comes before that. I wanted, I was going to ride in the land race. Ron, before the, the the day the race was going to happen, Ron came up to me and said, Dad, uh, I don't think we're going to let you ride in the race. And I said, well, how come? And he said, well, uh, he said, the, the, uh, the, 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 the wrangler and the stunt gaffer, I think it's maybe a little too dangerous, and you have a lot to do in the movie, and I'd hate to see you get hurt, and that we'd have to replace you. And... Uh, so he says, uh, better, better you not do that. And I said, Ron, you're the boss. You're the director. I recognize that. I said, uh, but let me tell you something. Both of my grandfathers ran in that race. One grandfather, Ralph Tallman, rode a horse. My other grandfather ran in a buggy. And I said, they ran in that race. And I said, I am a better rider now than they ever were. And they, did, they didn't get hurt. Nothing happened to them. And he looked at me for about 15 seconds. And he said, Dad, go get your horse. <laughs> and I rode in the race, sitting there waiting for the race to start, waiting for the cannon to fire to start this race, and thinking that oh, about 100 years ago, my grandfathers were out here in a similar place, ready to run this race. And Rhonda, I got to tell you, the hair just stood up on the back of my neck. It was just an incredible feeling. And I ended up running in the race and nothing happened to me because I'm sitting here talking to you today. Well, that's a great story. 
So in the few minutes we have left, I think I'll have to have you come back again for another hour. You've had such a lofty career. <laughs> what would you give, what is the best advice you could give to young people trying to break into the acting business today? Let me tell you another story. <laughs> when I was at the University of Oklahoma, a very fine actor named Van Heflin came, came to, through Oklahoma and he was beating the drum for a movie that he was starring in called Green Dolphin Street. His name, Van Heflin. And uh, he, he talked to, he came out and talked to the drama students. And he said, listen, he said, this is a hard business. And if there's anything in the world you would be happy doing, he says, I suggest you get up, walk out of here and go do it. Go do something else. Because he said, this is a, a hard business. And he said, just, he said, that would be my advice. Go find something else. He says, but, he says, if you in your heart know there's nothing else you want to do, then rest assured that you can find a place in show business for yourself. There is a niche there. There's something, you, it might not be what you're planning. It might not be what you think you'd like to do, but you can find a place for yourself. And that was reassuring to me because I didn't want to do anything else. And I thought, well, okay, okay so, so I have to do something else. Yeah, but, but, but I can be associated with the business. So I guess my advice to young people is if, if there's something else that interests you, something else that you would be, feel good doing, you're perhaps, perhaps you would be more secure doing that. Because there are a lot of wonderful professions there are a lot of good things you can do with your life. But if, if somehow or another you think you have to be an actor, you have to be a writer, you have to be a director, you have to be a producer, or something like that, stick to it. Don't give up easy. Because a lot of times, a lot of times you feel like you want to quit. Don't quit. Hang in there. I When I... I, when I was first looking for a drama school, I went to Oklahoma a and I went to the gymnasium because I thought I might be able to get some kind of a boxing scholarship. But they didn't have boxing, they had wrestling. Well, I didn't want to be a wrestler, I want to be a boxer. So, and, and they, they didn't have a good drama school, they had a speech department. So I, I realized that Oklahoma a and wasn't for me. But leaving the gymnasium, I looked up, there was a big sign that said, when you think you have come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. <laughs> and I've looked, I've relived that, and I thought, my goodness, what good advice that is. That is. So if you think you want to try to be an actor, you're trying to be a director or something, and you've come to the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. I love that. And Rance, thank you so much for being on the Home Movie Legacy Project. That's a wrap, everybody. We'll see you next week. My pleasure.